Well, please do turn to that passage in Acts 2. We're going to work through it uh, together. Now, in the late 19th century, uh, Western Union, who were uh, an American telegraph company, so that's how they used to send kind of letter, you know, messages te- through telegraphs, uh, they were approached by a man called Alexander Graham Bell. And Alexander Graham Bell, um, he had this new invention. And Alexander Bell had this invention that he wanted to kind of offer to this company, Western Union. He said, look, here is my new invention. It's called a telephone. And for $100,000, um, you can have the patent for it. It can be yours to own. Uh, William Orton, who was the president of uh, Western Union at that time, um, apparently he dismissed Bell and said, no, this is just a toy. It's never going to catch on, this telephone. Never catch on. Um, and it has no commercial value at all. And so here he was, he missed it. And, and then um, Gray, Alexander Graham Bell obviously went on to do well on his own and, and to sell this telephone and to, to use over. And obviously now, most of us have got one in our pockets even today. You think of what, where that went. So here was this man from Western Union. He had, he had in before him something amazing, the potential for such a life-changing thing. And he missed it. He totally missed it. We're looking at a hugely significant time in the history of the church and the world. And last week we saw on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God descends on his people with power. And the followers of Jesus, there they were. They were able to tell of the mighty works to those around them. And people heard them in their own languages. And everybody was kind of standing there thinking, wow, this is, some were thinking this is amazing. But there were many thinking, this is just nonsense. They were just writing it off. Or they're just drunk. We can't listen to what they're saying. And they were so close to missing out on something glorious. So Peter, in this passage, he wants to explain to them, look, this is what's happened. So in verse 9, that's why, in, sorry, in verse 14, he says, uh, look, we are not uh, drunk. In verse 15, sorry, we're not drunk. These people aren't drunk. Don't, don't write this off like that. You can't just write it off. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. He starts with a joke, really, because he's, say, he's saying, look, we haven't had breakfast. We're not drunk. But let me tell you what's happening. Let me explain to you the story and the message of what this is all about. And so what we get to see in this is Peter kind of showing what the message of Jesus is all about. So today, it's a reminder to us, we possess something glorious. As a church, through the Bible, through the gospel, we've got in possession of something amazing. And if you're a Christian this morning, it is yours. You own it, as it were. But the problem is we so often forget how good it is. We forget what we're part of. When just the busyness of life and day-to-day life comes in, we just take our eyes off just, just the greatness and the majesty of the gospel message. And so today's a chance for us to say, Lord, would you show me afresh just how great this is? And if you're not a Christian here this morning, look, you're in, you're in the, you've got great potential this morning because you're uh, before and you're listening to this great message just like that man who was owner of Western Union. You know, he, he had the potential, but he, he missed it. So let me urge you, don't miss out this morning. The message Peter gives really helps sum up the message of Christianity. Maybe today you're wondering, is this true? Maybe you've dismissed it. Maybe you've just grown cold to it. Maybe you've just taken your eyes off it. Well, let's come and look at what Peter shares with the people. Look, first of all, before we uh, share what the headings are, look where this is headed. In verse 37, after Peter has finished, look what their response is. He says, they, they were cut to the heart. So they heard what, what the Peter just shared, and they were just cut to the heart. That is, they felt it. Oh, and then they say, what must we do? And then 3,000 people become Christians. So that's what the impact of this message was. So what did they hear? What did they grasp at the end that they didn't see at the beginning? Well, there's four headings for us to look at. The first is this. The mess, and the question we're going to ask is why we, why we can't dismiss this message. This message is bigger than you realize. This message is bigger than you realize. Look at verses 14 down to 21, really. So Peter stands up and he says, look, what's happening before you now with these languages going out, with the Spirit of God descending, is something major. And it isn't something that has just kind of happened out of the blue. No, this is part of God's big plan of salvation. And so what he does in verses 17 down to 21 is he quotes from the Old Testament, from the prophet Joel, written about seven, eight hundred years before this day. 
and he's saying look joel wrote about what's happening right now he looked ahead and he prophesied it and he said look the spirit of god will come now just as a side note um, the Spirit of God is present in the Old Testament. He doesn't just show up in Acts chapter 2. We see him helping and equipping people to do certain jobs at certain times throughout the Old Testament. So people would have visions, like Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel. He'd have vision, and he shared that vision with God's people. People would dream dreams. Uh, people would prophesy. They would preach, and God would give them the Spirit to help them for that job at that time. But here we're saying, look, this is the promise that Joel has. Look at that in verse 17. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Young men, old men shall see visions and dream dreams. This is, again, like what was happening to those few people in the Old Testament. And male servants and female servants. So people from all types of backgrounds, all levels of, of society. Everybody who trusts in Jesus will get the spirit of God given to them it's for everybody everyone will do it so there's everybody is equal isn't that great just as, again just to think about that as a church there is not just one person who has the spirit but everybody or each one of us if we're trusting in jesus we all have the spirit of god dwelling within us young and old uh, whatever our background whatever our job it doesn't matter we're all equal and we are um depending on and trusting in um what jesus has done for us it's not just restricted to a few special people but we're all kind of equal together in God's eyes. And Peter is saying here, what you're seeing is so significant. This is what Joel prophesied. And that means, verse 17, we are in the last days. Isn't that interesting? The last days. Verse 18, he says, um, in those days I will pour out my spirit. So he's saying these are the last days. So it's not a kind of, um, that phrase, the last days, isn't a kind of a, a, if you see it, you kind of seen something special. No, the Bible says that the last days is, is the period after Jesus ascends to heaven and before he returns. So are we in the last days? Yes, we are. <laughs> because the next thing on God's calendar is the return of Jesus. So this moment of the Spirit descending is like, you know those um, sand timers? Um, I think the most common place we see them is in board games now, isn't it? You kind of turn them upside down, you get this little white sand that trickles through. Sometimes you get really big ones, couldn't you? Not in a board game, but you'd, kind of that timer is turned over and the sand is trickling down. Well, in the same way, when the Spirit descends, God's sand timer, as it were, is turned over, and the next thing is Jesus' return. We're in the last days, that saying. So we're looking ahead to Jesus coming back. And that means, that's why he says in verse 20, the sun shall be turned black. On that day, this is what's going to happen. You know, it's going to be the great day of the Lord. The great day of the Lord when uh, Jesus will return. So Joel, as he was kind of looking ahead, you know what it's like when you, um, when you drive through a mountain range? Yeah, you drive, you look at like from some miles away, you look at these mountains and they're all kind of in one, you see them in one kind of view. But as you drive through, you see that the peak of one is, oh, you've just passed the peak, and then there's a peak over there. And it's further away than you realize from a, at first. Well, Joel was prophesying, this is what's going to happen. There's the mountain range, the Spirit's going to come, and it's going to be the day of the Lord. He saw it as one thing. But as we get closer to it, as um, Peter's saying here, look, the Spirit has come, that's one mountain peak. And the next one, that's Jesus coming back. So we're in the last days. Now, why is this important? What difference does it make to us today? Well, first of all, it means this. The message of the gospel, the message of Jesus, isn't just something that just started 2,000 years ago when Jesus turned up. This has been God's plan forever. This has always been uh, the plan of God. The whole history was all pointing to and all about Jesus. And so we are part of something huge. Remember the big picture of the Bible? The big picture is that we were made in God's image, made to know him, to love him, to enjoy him. But instead of knowing him and loving him and enjoying him, we went our own way. We walked away from him. We rejected him, and as a result, the world falls apart. But God says, I'm going to send a king. I'm going to send someone who's going to fix it all. And he's going to come from this line, this family, God's people. And so you follow the family line. You're waiting for the king. You're waiting for the king. Some kings come, they look good, but they're not the one. Some people come and they look like they're going to be the one, but they're not. They fail. And then eventually, on that, morn uh, that morning, that day in Bethlehem, Jesus is born. The Messiah has come. He has come um, to do God's work 
And then we see as he grows up, when people who are sick come near him, they're fixed. When people are crying near him, the tears are wiped away. He turns it to joy because he's given us a glimpse of when I come back, that's the kind of world it'll be. No sickness, no tears, no death. I'll reverse it all. And so Jesus comes into this world. Then he lives the perfect life that as humans made in God's image, we were supposed to live, but we couldn't. He lived the perfect human life. And he died the death we deserve. He took our curse on the cross. Then he rose again because death couldn't hold him, which we'll look, look at in a few moments. But there he is risen. And then he ascends to heaven. And he says, my spirit is coming. Now, his spirit is sent. And then we wait for the next part, for the king to return to totally fix the world so that everybody who trusts in him will be part of the new world, which is made new and fixed. So the history of the world at the heart of it all is Jesus Christ. He is what it's all about. So if you're not a Christian here this morning, can you see Jesus isn't just somebody who's a kind of sideline figure who kind of made a cameo, you know, a cameo sometimes you see in films, these, um, the big names there, it's like this person's in this film and they, they just literally poke their head in for one scene and then they're gone, get their big fee and go. I think is that Jesus, he just poke his head into history and then that's it? No, 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 it is all about him. It is his story. It's all for Jesus. So you can't just say, oh, well, I'll give or take him. He's either the Lord of all or he's nobody. And it means we can't write him up. It means you have to decide this morning, is he Lord or is he not? You can't sit on the fence with Jesus. And if you're a Christian, isn't this a great encouragement to remind us? We can feel so small, can't we? We can feel so intimidated by what's going on around us where people just turn uh, against Christianity and against Jesus and they mock it and we just feel like it's on the sideline. But here we are part. The one who is our Lord and Master is the Lord of history. We feel small, but we've got on our side the one who is Lord of all. Are you living like he's Lord of all? Are you encouraged by that? And also let's apply that to our daily lives. Is he Lord and Master of your daily lives not just the big picture but are you, are you submitting to him in every area of your life or are you saying to the lord of the universe thanks for your advice i'll have a think about it and i'll get back to you the lord of the universe here says this is how i want you to live this is what's best for you let's submit to him and say lord i want to serve and honor you so the news that we're part of is bigger than you realize what cuts these people to the heart why is this such good news because it's bigger than we realize. The second thing we need to see in verses 22 down to 36 is this news is more believable than you realize. This news is more believable than you realize. It's interesting what Peter does in his sermon. He starts and he's speaking to Jews. They've all come to Jerusalem to celebrate this, um, this feast of Pentecost. Uh, and so he uses their book, the Old Testament. He says, look, this is the one you've been waiting for. Let me show you how Jesus is in the Old Testament. All, all the Bible is about him. Again, he would have got this from Jesus. It's interesting to note as well, isn't it? Remember Peter, whenever you see him in the Gospels, whenever he speaks, he's just, you kind of like thinking, oh no. You know, have you got friends like that? When they start to speak, you think, oh no, what are they going to say now? Just think, you don't know what they're going to say. Peter's that kind of person. You just think, oh, here he goes again. And so as Peter stands up, you wonder if the apostles are thinking, oh no, how's this going to go? But this is changed. This is a different Peter. He is filled with the Spirit. He has encountered Jesus. He has met Jesus in his failure. Remember, he denied Jesus three times. He said, I don't know him. He has been humbled to the core. Now he is filled with the Spirit and he speaks. And what does he say? He says, look, let me show you that Jesus is the one we were waiting for. He's the Messiah you, you need. He's the Messiah you've been waiting for. And he says, look at the evidence. Look at the evidence. Look at verse 22. Look at his life and his works. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you with, by God with mighty works and wonders and signs. They all knew about Jesus. They all knew that he'd been doing amazing things. It wasn't kind of something they had to look far to find out about. Everyone was talking about him. And they, he said, look, God attested himself. He proved to you that he was, uh, Jesus was the son of God because he had power over diseases. He had power over the evil spirits. He had power over nature. He had power over death. Everything was under his control when he was here, showing us that he is the Messiah. This isn't a normal man. This isn't somebody who is just, um, you know, just a, a, a normal historical figure. 
This is the Messiah. And he says, you know this, he says. Um, He did this in your midst as you yourselves know. Think. Use your mind. You can believe this because you know this is true. You've seen it. Not only that, but verse 23, he also died. So look at his life, look at his works, look at his death, verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Why did Jesus die? Was it because people um, planned to go against him? Was it because he was part of a, a kind of this conspiracy to get him crucified and killed because he was having too much power and influence? Or was it the plan of God? What's the answer of verse 23? Yes. It's both. They planned and they conspired to get him on the cross, but it was all part of God's plan. Were they guilty of his death? Yes. But had God planned it as well? Yes. Those things, God's sovereignty, our responsibility in the Bible are held together. Even if it blows our mind, the Bible can hold those things together. God can be sovereign and we can be responsible. You see, his death, look at it. He, he lived the perfect life. He did these amazing things. He died. Not only that, verse 24, remember, he rose again. God raised him up, uh, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. The pangs of death, that is, the birth pains. I haven't had a a, a child, obviously, (laughs) but if you ask somebody who has, and if you said, you know, when the baby wants to come, can you just say, no, not now, not today? Today's not convenient, actually. Can we have it in a week or two? No, if the baby wants to come, the baby's going to come. Yeah, that's, just, that's just the way it goes. And it's the same with death. Jesus couldn't be held by death. It just had, he had to break free. Death had no hold on him. He hadn't done anything wrong. He hadn't sinned. He'd taken the punishment we deserve, and death was just broken. He was resurrected. He was too powerful for it. And Peter wants to say, look, the resurrection of Jesus... We're told about in the Old Testament, in our book, in the Old Testament. Look, David tells us about him in verse um, 27. He says, uh, you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. So David is saying, look, you're going to look after me and I know you're going to look after me because there's a Holy One who you will not let, um, whose body will not let see corruption. See, David isn't talking about himself because David, he he goes on to say, we could go and see his grave. We could go if we wanted to and find his bones. He's corrupted. His body is gone. But Jesus, let's go to the grave. It's empty. His body hasn't seen corruption. So David was speaking about Jesus. King David was pointing to the true king. David, verse 30, saying he was prophesying. Being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn an oath to him, they would set one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. So can you see what Peter is doing? He's saying, look at Jesus' life. You saw it. You know you've heard about it. People aren't just making it up. He really died. He rose again. And then verse 32 to 33, he says he ascended. He's not dead now, but he's alive. He's gone back to heaven. And as a result of that, he has sent his spirit. What you're seeing today, the spirit descending is a direct result of his ascension. In John 14, Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. When I go to heaven, I'm going to ask my Father to send me. So what's the proof that Jesus has ascended? The Spirit has come. He's come. And so Peter's conclusion, verse 36, he says, So let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made Jesus, him, Lord and Christ. This is a conclusion. You know it's true, he says. Think about it. Think about what you've seen. Think about what you've heard. Think about what you know. You saw Jesus die. You know the tomb is empty. They could just go and find him otherwise. You could go and get a wheel out his body. But they knew all of this. Now the reason why I did a pause here is to say, look, look what Peter's saying. He's saying, look, think about it. How is it, why is this message good news? Because it's something that can be analyzed, thought about, something that can be investigated. If you're not a Christian here today, perhaps you, you think, well, there's no way I could believe this. You know, It just seems so far-fetched. I'm someone who needs evidence. I'm someone who, uh, you know, I I can't just believe things like this. I can't just leave my brains at the door. But here, God, we're seeing work through means. And one of those means is the evidence. And God wants us to look at something and think. This is something that has held up 
to so many attacks and so much scrutiny over centuries. And still, the message of Jesus is going all over the world. I know it feels like in this country, like it's shrinking somewhat. But in other parts of the world, it is exploding. How? Why can't they just disprove it? Because it is real. And there is evidence and you can think it through. How do you explain just the explosion of the church from this point until today? How do you explain it outliving the Roman Empire and turning it upside down from just you know, 12 or 120 believers who weren't trained, special, just grew because God was in it. These men are all willing to give their lives for the sake of Jesus. And he's saying, look, think. Being a Christian isn't, doesn't mean you don't have to think. It doesn't mean you don't have to ignore the evidence, but actually it's, it's there for us to look at. And if you are a Christian, again, it's easy for us to lose our confidence, isn't it? Easy for us to be intimidated by the voices around. But again, here's a great reminder. This stands up to scrutiny. Look at it again. If you want some books to read that will help with that, please do ask after. There's so many around that can give you encouragement and, uh, and, and can strengthen faith, maybe where we're feeling under attack or threatened. We can really believe this without jeopardizing logic and thinking. This news is bigger than you realize. It's more believable than you realize. And the third thing we see in this message and why they were cut to the heart and why it's such good news is because this news is more personal than you realize. Peter has just shown them, here is the promised one, the one where, whom all of history is pointing to. He is the Messiah. I've showed you in your book, the Old Testament. I've shown you him there. Look and think what he did. Think what you know. Think of what happened to that Jesus. The Messiah has come. The one we've been waiting for for centuries. But what did you do with him? You killed him. Verse 23. You crucified and killed him. And just to emphasize it again, verse 36. Whom you crucified. They had totally missed it. He was here. The Messiah was here. And we totally misunderstood what was happening. And when they heard this, they're cut to the heart. What have we done? What have we done? When you become a Christian, when God's Spirit starts to work in you, the way you see the cross totally changes. It's not just a man in history who died on a Roman torture, a death design thing. There is somebody who died for me. I was there. It's real. But so often we can miss that. Do you remember the story of Beth Gellert? Um, Beth Gellert is a place in North Wales. It means Bill, uh, Gellert's be Hang on, let me get my words out. Gellert's grave. Beth Gellert. It's a place in North Wales. And it's based on this story, this legend, of Llewellyn in the 13th century. So he had been out hunting. And he came back. And when he returned home, his, his dog, Gellert, came to greet him. And his dog was covered in blood. And so he, um, he looks and wonders, why is he covered in blood? And then he thinks about his, his baby, um, Llewellyn's baby. And he looked and the baby's crib was empty. Um, but the, blood, the crib is covered in blood. So what does Llewellyn think? He thinks, my dog, Gellert, has killed my son. And so in a rage, he gets out his sword, kills the dog. And then, a little while later, he hears a cry. And it's, it's the cry of his son, the baby. And he sees the baby is actually perfectly well and safe. But next to the baby was a wolf that Gellert, the dog, had killed in order to save the baby. And then, you know, the story goes that Llewellyn, um, from that day on, never smiled again because he misunderstood the whole situation. You know, as I'm telling that story, it's emotional, isn't it? You think, oh, and he feels so sad for this dog. Oh, no, how could he do that? He misunderstood the dog's death. How much greater when you look at the cross and you start to realize, I've totally missed it. I saw him hanging there and I thought he was just a figure in history. But now I'm starting to see he did it for me. What have I done? What have I done? It's my sin. We're going to sing in a few moments, Behold the man upon the cross, my sins upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. Mel Gibson, when he was doing the film The Passion of Christ many years ago, he was filming the scene of Jesus being nailed to the cross. And whatever you think about that film, it's really interesting that 
who was the actor that Mel Gibson chose to play that um, Roman soldier? It was him. He put himself there because he realized he nailed Jesus to the cross. He was there for me. Martin Luther, the um, German theologian in the 17th, 16th century, says we carry the nails of Jesus in our pockets. He did it for me. I wonder today, do you realize that Jesus' death isn't just something historic, but it's something that he did for you? I was there. He died on the cross for me. When we see that, we are cut to the heart. He did it for me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for taking my judgment. Thank you for taking my pain. Thank you for dying in my place. It was God's plan. And he did that because he loves you so much. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. He took our curse. He didn't deserve it. We did. He went as the ultimate sinner to the cross to take all the wrong I've done. All the things that people know about, all the things people don't. All poured on Jesus and he took that sin for me. Have you seen that? Have you believed that? When was the last time you rejoiced in it? And maybe for the first time you need to be like the crowd here and they say, I can see it. What shall we do? What's next? That's right. He came to save the world. So this news is bigger than you realize. It's more believable than you realize. It's more personal than you realize. And the last thing is this. The story is more, or the news is, what did I say? Message. That's right. I've changed it three or four times this week. The message is more urgent than you realize. The Spirit of God is at work in their hearts. And so they ask, right, Peter, brothers, what do we do? We've killed him. We killed the Messiah. And Peter has two answers, verse 38. Repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Repent, that means turn in an opposite direction. Turn 180 degrees. Instead of going the way you were going, you say, right, my life was headed in totally the wrong way. Now I'm going to follow Jesus. He's going this way. I'm following him. I'm going to put my faith in him, not me. And then be baptized. That is an outward picture of what it means to follow Jesus. As we saw a few weeks ago, you go down into the water. Why? Because my old self is dying, the new self rises again. I'm going down into the water because Christ died and I'm now united to him and I'm risen again to live following him. You know, we go down to the water because I'm being washed from all the wrong that I've done. You see, believe and be baptized. Just as a side, if you're a Christian and you haven't been baptized, can you see why you need to be? It's a command of Jesus. It's part of following him. So talk to me after if you haven't and you want to. That's something you need to do as part of following Jesus. So what would happen? Two things would happen. He says, look, if you believe and you're baptized, that's kind of one thing, you trust and you're baptized, then you are forgiven for all the wrong you've done. Verse 36. Um, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, as you put your trust in Jesus, two things happen. You're forgiven, and then you're gifted the Holy Spirit. They're not separate. They come together. So as you trust in Jesus, you get given the Spirit of God. So everybody who trusts in him has the Spirit of God dwelling within them. That's the promise for all who trust in him. And this was something that was urgent, isn't it? At the end of verse 21, it says, Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. They called, and by the end of that day, 3,000 people did it and said, Yes, I want to be baptized. Logistically, I don't know how they got through 3,000 people. Five was a lot the other week, wasn't it, baptizing? You think of 3,000. Amazing. But they did it. They got baptized. Uh, and they followed Jesus. And the reality for us today is this. This is an urgent message. It's not something we put off. The reality is we don't know how long we've got until, number one, Jesus returns. That last day, the, the sand timer is, is, is going down. It's trickling down. But also, we don't know how long we've got left in our life, do we? It could be at any moment. This could be the last time you sit here. That's the reality. For people who we know, there was a time when it was their last Sunday, their last chance to respond. If this is you and God is saying, look, you need to do something with this. Don't put it off. Today is the day of salvation. Turn to him today. And what does that mean? It just means Jesus saying, Jesus, I need you. I did that. I put you on the cross and I'm sorry. Forgive me. Today is the day of salvation. And now in this moment, you can be forgiven. Even right now. And the Spirit of God will dwell in your life. You're not on your own. 
God says, I will dwell with you and help you all the way. So if you're a Christian this morning, look at this message. Can you see it's bigger than you realize? We're part of what the history is all about. God in his kindness has showed us. It's more believable than we realize. This is something we can truly believe and grasp. It's more personal than we realize because it is us who nailed him to the cross and is urgent because you need to believe and follow and trust today. What are you going to do with the news of Jesus? If you're believing, let's rejoice. If you're not, let's trust and let's follow him uh, all our days. Let's spend a few moments just in silence before we sing our last song together, just reflecting on um, the greatness of the message of Jesus together. So, Father, we pray now that you would help us to see just how wonderful the cross of Jesus is and all that he did for us. Help us to realize it was our sin that held him there. And help us to rejoice that he did that because of his deep love for us. And we ask this in his name. Amen.